I think I'm ready when you are, Fui, so the microphone is yours. Ready? Hello. Hey, everybody. We are very happy to be with you this afternoon, which is my time and uh, Daniel's time. Um, very much looking forward to that conversation, and I do hope that you all are looking forward to it as well. What we propose to do is to go through a number of issues relating to the um, uh, international arbitration in Africa. Obviously, it's a large topic, and we have selected a number of elements that we'll try and devote the time that we have to. Daniel is a partner in the international arbitration team at Stewart's in London. He leads the team's Africa focus and is a specialist in disputes from the African continent. He has particular expertise in oil and gas and IT, but his experience covers a wide variety of markets and geographies. Daniel is fluent in English and French, and he's worked on, in various countries on the African continent. Daniel, I think there's no way we can have a conversation about international arbitration in Africa these days without getting into the issue of virtual hearings. <laughs> yeah. We for me it's, it's quite interesting i i'm curious about how judges arbitrators of the sort of generation with which i'm familiar <laughs> have, have actually handled issues about virtual hearings and i know that your your firm and you personally have experience of engaging in, in this with judges and arbitrators. So I was wondering whether you could start us off by just telling us what has been happening in England with, with English judges. Sure, very happy to do so. And Fui, thank you for the kind introduction, first of all. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to have you uh, sort of on the other side of this conversation today. And thank you to everyone for attending. Uh, that's a, as you say, that's a big, a big question free and, and many ways that one could answer it. Uh, I, I think the, the headline is that certainly uh, in the English and Welsh jurisdictions, so in the English courts, uh, judges of all levels of seniority, experience uh, and wisdom um, have taken to virtual hearings very well. There have of course been some teething problems, as you might expect because a transition to a virtual hearing requires a number of uh, boxes to be ticked, not just in terms of the technology, but in terms of training, and in terms of, frankly, all participants knowing what's going on and collaborating. I think, you know, in our jurisdiction, the transition to virtual hearings has been significantly assisted by political support. So the government very quickly mandating that uh, the wheels of justice had to continue to turn uh, and the senior members of the judiciary the lord chief justice and similar issuing again very quickly statements that despite the pandemic and despite the physical closure of courts uh, justice would continue uh, and in particular guidance being issued as to how that would be affected and i know i've done a number of webinars for example in nigeria involving a number of the, the courts in Lagos State, Ogun State and similar, which have been exploring similar, similar ways of using uh, virtual technology to, to facilitate the administration of justice. So the, the headline is, it has gone very well. The position today is that uh, all hearings by and large will continue. Uh, there are exceptions and good exceptions uh, to, to that, but as a general rule, hearings will continue. As the pandemic eases now in these later months, we are starting to see varieties of hearing, whether fully virtual, hybrid, 
insofar as certain persons being in court, certain persons not, or indeed fully in-person hearings where, for example, a courtroom can allow social distancing uh, and similar to take place. Uh, but yeah, overall, it's been, it's been a very positive experience, I would say, for us. Perhaps you could just touch very quickly on what sort of challenges there have been. Sure. I think, I mean, we, so my firm was the first firm to conduct a fully virtual hearing in the commercial court. Uh, and that was in respect of resisting the enforcement uh, of an uh, arbitration award uh, secured under the Energy Charter Treaty. So a bit of an arbitration angle as well, albeit in, in uh, English court proceedings. Uh, we had to convert to a fully virtual hearing in the space of about one week, uh, which was pretty quick by most standards. Uh, and that had to take account of clients being based in Kazakhstan, experts being based in the USA, uh, of witnesses being based in Belgium and the Netherlands. So, uh, you know, a number of parties around the world. I think the first challenge we faced was actually a technological one. I think the English courts have for a while had the ability to conduct certain aspects of proceedings on a virtual basis, principally the cross-examination uh, of witnesses or the testimony of, of witnesses uh, via video link or similar. But clearly moving everyone onto a virtual platform was a challenge. And in fact, we found that the, the judge on our particular case didn't have the necessary software available to, to allow him to join a fully virtual hearing. And so we configured a laptop with the software and just sent it to him directly for the hearing. So there were some teething problems there, although I think that was very much uh, the result of the early phase of the pandemic. I think uh, everyone has now caught up. I think since then, we've experienced a number of challenges which, which broadly appear consistent across the industry and now are widely reported on various uh, sort of attempts to assess the success of virtual hearings. One, and I'm sure everyone might uh, sort of relate to this, is actually how it's more tiring to conduct a virtual hearing rather than an in-person hearing. Uh, staring at a screen for seven hours uh, it makes one a lot more sleepy than staring uh, at a judge or an opponent uh, in a slightly dusty courtroom. Uh, and so clearly, you know, one has to take that into uh, account. There are, of course, have been some entertaining and perhaps less entertaining moments with the use or the failure to use the mute button. Uh, in one particular instance, uh, I shan't name names for obvious reasons. Uh, we heard opposing counsel uh, make some rather unsavory remarks about the performance of a witness, uh, not realizing that uh, their mute button was not uh, fully pressed in. Uh, so that was entertaining. And there has been some anecdotal evidence as well, although I've, I've not experienced it myself, of a measure of formality being lost in virtual proceedings. And that's not to say that uh, we turn up in t-shirts and shorts, but it's to say in terms of the decorum and propriety of running proceedings, which you know one may have a view anyway as to whether that's appropriate or not, but certainly there have been instances of, of people being a little more relaxed, uh, a little more prepared uh, to, to comment by return or to object or otherwise. Uh, and so I think it's probably beholden on all of us to, to remember uh, that uh, whilst the hearing is virtual, everything else remains as before. In terms of approach but those aside I think you know broadly speaking the, the transition to virtual hearings has been a success and some of the fears that people had as to poor internet connectivity haven't necessarily borne fruit I mean I had one expert whose internet connection dropped and they reconnected uh, to the proceedings via a 4g connection and that was that was fine they had to turn their video off but the audio uh, link was fine and I think as well, provided parties have a frank and open conversation with, in the, in, you know, in the case of litigation, the judge, or in the case of, of arbitration, the tribunal, as to what happens if a problem arises. 
so that everyone knows what needs to be done, whether you wait for a party to, to reconnect if their connection is poor or you, you reschedule and reconvene later in the day. Uh, I think provided those expectations are set and a mechanism is in place, um, you know, there, there, there's very little actually that, that stops a virtual hearing from proceeding, provided, of course, it is suitable to the case for such a hearing to take place on a virtual basis. Thanks, Daniel. This is all very interesting. I, I think we, we could very easily spend the whole of our <laughs> time sort of discussing this. But again, I just would like you to take a couple of minutes and just tra to transpose that experience or the challenges from that to an international arbitration hearing involving an Africa, African country. If you were preparing, let us say, you know, some state officials in any, in any African country for virtual hearing, for anticipating what would happen in a virtual hearing, what would you be saying to them? What should they be looking out for? Where should their preparation focus on? What should they expect to see? Mm. It's, it's a good question, Free, and I think actually what was going through my mind when you said that was the prior question of would a virtual hearing be appropriate? Because I do think actually where you have a client who has little experience of say arbitration or little experience of testifying as a witness, there are actually some potential downsides for that first experience to be in a virtual setting. We all know, I'm sure, how difficult it can be for witnesses to give evidence. Uh, and inevitably, there needs to be a measure of explanation by lawyers to their clients as to how it works, the tricks that opposing counsel might use in seeking to cross-examine, uh, and you know how one delivers their evidence in a way that the tribunal will comprehend. I think some of those uh, observations might get lost in a virtual setting. But assuming a virtual hearing is appropriate or perhaps even if not appropriate becomes necessary for whatever reason, uh, I, I, think, I think it is important, it goes back to my, my point about formality, I think it is important to advise the client appropriately as to the formality of the event. And so what you don't want is a witness delivering their evidence, for example, in a room where there is no peace and quiet, uh, where they don't have a tested internet connection, where there will be no distractions. Uh, you, of course, need to plan a lot more in advance. For example, a witness will be taken to documents in a bundle. If you are doing that on a virtual basis, you may need to have a hard copy bundle there for the witness ready and have oriented through them through the pages. Or if they are to use a virtual bundle, as is now very often the case, uh, they perhaps need to have multiple screens uh, to allow them to navigate through the bundle whilst delivering their evidence. So I think there's a lot of more planning that needs to take place in addition to setting expectations as to how the experience will unfurl. Thank you, Daniel. I think this has been interesting, indicative. Um, I would like us to move on now to another topical issue, which is perhaps long, likely to be longer lasting. That has to do with the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. There are issues about dispute settlement mechanisms. Um, I hope we have with us Leu Tameru, who runs IAP. She's a consultant. And uh, I remember having a a casual conversation with her last year, about a year ago, in which she said some things which just prompted me to think a little more closely about yes, the issues on the agenda uh, than I would have done uh, before. So if Leu is on, could we ask her to come in and just give us you know, a few moments of her thoughts on what the principal issues are in relation to dispute uh, resolution you know in the uh, around the continental free trade agreement okay hi everyone um i don't know if you can hear me well yes we can 
Okay, you can see me too. That's perfect. <laughs> I was trying to let me get to a better location. Um, thank you so much for the invitation. I am um, quite grateful. I had just walked into my place, so it kind of worked out perfectly. Um, I am super grateful for the invitation. It's been a fantastic um, point to talk about. The CFTA is very exciting for me. Um, so like I mentioned, I'm going to quickly in two or two and a half minutes to three minutes that you've given me, try and outline um, uh, two major issues. Um, so the investment protocol of the CFTA um, has two major issues that it's currently going to have to battle in order to come into existence. The first one is a decision on the investor state dispute settlement um, mechanism. So the question is, will there be an ISDS mechanism? Now, let's keep in mind that the CFTA already has a dispute resolution protocol. And in that dispute resolution protocol, the only type of dispute that's taken into consideration is state to state dispute. So if there is going to be an ISDS, it will have to be a novelty to be introduced uh, and potentially even an amendment to the dispute settlement protocol. Now, the issue of the dispute settlement protocol um, and the ISDS already being kind of clashing at the beginning is a bit of a concern. But the case for the ISDS within the investment protocol relates to this. African countries have signed thousands <laughs> over, you know, 1,200 or 1,300 um, uh, bilateral investment treaties with um, African countries, but also third party countries. And in all of these BITs, there is a specific agreement and mention to investor state dispute settlement as, a, as an option to investors from the uh, host con uh, home countries. If the ISDS of the CFTA does not allow for the ISDS mechanism to be opened, then we will be in a situation where, let's say, MTN, a South African telecom company that invests under the investment um, protocol, um, in Ethiopia, for example, which is currently opening, uh, you know, we are opening our telecom industry. If MTN invests and Vodacom invests, MTN would come through the CFTA protocol. Um, and, and Vodacom would come through a bilateral investment treaty signed between whether it's the UK or the Netherlands. Now, in a moment where Ethiopian government takes one action in the telecom industry, Vodacom would have the opportunity to directly go and sue the Ethiopian government, while MTN, if there's no ISDS protocol, will have to go through the dispute settlement protocol, which means they have to go to their government, and their government would have to reach out to the Ethiopian government, and then they'd have to negotiate at a government level, which makes um, the trading difficult, because if in fact the CFTA is coming into place because we want to encourage intra-Africa trade, Creating this difficulty makes it very hard for African investors to move outside of their boundaries. The other issue is with regards to BIT signed between African states. Now, if African states have signed BITs with other African states, they definitely have, there's about 300 or 400 BITs signed within African states. There are ISDS provisions in those BITs. Why would it be beneficial to their investors from these African states to be to invest through the investment protocol of the CFTA rather than the BITs that are currently in place. Now we're going to have to see the quick example of the EU and how the EU treated intra-EU BITs, which I think is a very interesting mechanism, where intra-EU BITs have officially been cancelled, not only just the BITs, but they've also cancelled the sunset clauses. So they're really canceled for real. <laughs> so the CFTA and the African continent are going to have to take a very hard look at really understanding the goal, the purpose, and how, in fact, if we are going to say no more ISDS, it would have to be no more ISDS for Africans and non-Africans. Um, and that's about it. And I hope I stayed within the few minutes that happened a lot, all accredited to me. <laughs> Thank you, Leo. I mean, you've packed in so much, which is interesting and quite concrete in the time. Daniel, is there anything that you wanted to sort of comment on in reaction to Leo? 
Well, I mean, I, I think I would first say that Leo is, is a stated expert on this. And so, I mean, in many ways, I'm not going to disagree with her very insightful comments. And, I, and I'm, not sure, I'm not sure I could. Uh, I think my, my overall comment would be, is to take a step back and, and work out what you think the purpose of the CFTA is. And I'm pleased, by the way, Liu, that you refer to it as a CFTA and not the AFCFTA, because very quickly you'll, you get tongue tied uh, and it <laughs> kind of rolls off the tongue that easily. So um, that is perhaps one area for improvement. Um, I think taking a step back, you know, as you rightly recognize at the moment, there is a, an effective WTO style dispute resolution mechanism as between states, which is not necessarily inconsistent with an objective of dropping tariffs as for trade as between states. The question is if you want the CFTA to do more, if you want it to promote investment or indeed promote commercial, uh, sort of the growth of commercial business intra-African states as well, then you might need to consider what else it needs to do or if something else should be there to do it. So it may well be that the answer to your second point is one party should rely on the BITs that are in place. And perhaps off the back of a off the CFTA, other BITs will come into existence. And of course, that puts to one side the entire debate about whether BITs are the right way to promote investment in any case. I think as well, uh, you know, uh, uh, the dark side of the moon for me uh, with the CFTA is you know, what about trade that's not in, of an investment type? What about simple contractual sales and purchases of goods from, say, I don't know, Ghana to Togo or, or Nigeria to Senegal or whatever it happens to be? You know, one would have thought that the natural mechanism for resolving disputes in, in respect of those trades is commercial arbitration. And then you get into a whole debate as to, well, which institution would be appropriate, what law, governing law would be appropriate, what seat would be appropriate. And it may well be that tallied with the CFTA, there could be some sort of move to try and homogenize one approach there too. But time will tell. But, but I certainly agree with you, Leo, that there are a lot of questions that remain unanswered and which I think um, you know, are being considered. And that, that's the most important thing in a sense, um, you know, you're not, you're not sleepwalking into this. People are giving very good and detailed thought to it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, just to come back to, firstly, the naming, <laughs> it, there was an actual conversation about this and there was a okay. serious discussion regarding branding. And the challenge of not just calling it CFTA was because the CFTA is the Canadian Free Trade Agreement. So sure. it's, it, 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 in order to kind of you know, avoid the confusion is the reason why AFCFTA, which is really difficult to say, and I, and everybody gets very confused all the time. So yes, um, but moving on, I think that you've raised a key point, which is what is the purpose of the CFTA? And the purpose of the CFTA, I think, in in not just only considering the pandemic, which has made a few things very obvious, is that it's not like any other free trade agreement. And the reason being is. Our countries are not producing yet. We're still exporting a lot of raw and basic, you know, primary goods and primary materials. So because we're doing that, we now have to create an investment protocol that allows us to build the processing, that allows us to, you know, um, depend on each other in order with regards to manufacturing. And that encourages manufacturing. So that's a completely different perspective with regards to other agreements than it is within these. It's not just facilitating trade. It's mm -hmm. facilitating the production of materials, which is, it's a development focused, you know, purpose. So that really does bring about a different um, aspect to it. And, and yes, and I think we really have to have the conversation on the impact BITs have had. And, and I think it's a very serious conversation that the CFTA secretary is taking on board and looking to do some work on that, is what has been the impact of these BITs, the intra-Africa BITs, but also the, the, the BITs with the, uh, the third parties, and have those had actual impact. And I think based off of the numbers, the data off of that, I think a decision is eminent. Mm, very good. Very good. Well, thank, thank you. you very, thank you very much, Le Leu. Um, um, da Daniel and Leu, the conversation that you've had now, I, I mean, I think that a sort of a natural progression would be to talk about uh, mechanisms for uh, dispute settlement within the continent and you know sort of in Africa 
but I just I want to interpose something different, perhaps as a slide under pressure from my young colleagues in my office. They really do want early on in this in this conversation to hear some things about training possibilities, training opportunities. So I'm going to ask you to do me the favor of just sharing some of your views. I know, Danielle, you've been involved in some uh, you know, sort of tra training activities and schemes. So just giving a broad brush view for a young person interested in getting more familiar with arbitration, international arbitration processes, what would you say to that person? That is another another big question, Fui, and thank thank you for asking. I think I think there are there are a number of ways that one can can learn, one can get up to speed, uh, and I, but I always start from the perspective of understanding arbitration as a jurisdiction, if I can call it that. You know, there there, there is a reason that arbitration exists in parallel to the court jurisdiction. Uh, it is intentionally different. Uh, it was created to resolve disputes in a way that perhaps domestic jurisdictions couldn't. And, and so I think something, certainly, something I certainly encourage my juniors to do whenever we face a problem in arbitration is to go back to basics and to start from why you know, we are having to consider this issue. Why, for example, do we say the tribunal has jurisdiction to do what we're asking it to do? From where does it derive its power uh, to do what we are asking it to do? What are the limitations, whether in law or otherwise, which would apply to the tribunal in this particular case? And, and so I guess the, 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 the short point I'm trying to say, no doubt poorly, is I think young arbitrators as a first step should get their head around arbitration law, if I can call it that, really understanding the building blocks of it. I think, you know, and I think there are a number of initiatives that exist to assist a number of books that exist, a number of resources that exist. The second thing for me uh, is real experience. Now that is of course circular in a way, without experience, it's difficult to get real experience. Uh, and yet you need real experience to get real experience often. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult problem to circumnavigate. But I do think now there are initiatives particularly focused on uh, the continent. Forgive me, my lights appear to be turning on and off randomly. Um, there are initiatives now involving lawyers on the continent. Uh, I mean, I, I pulled together a brief list here before. I think, you know, we have the Africa Arbitration Academy, with which I've been involved, I know many others have been no doubt people who are, are attending today, which is an excellent initiative. Uh, I was presenting at the Nigeria branch of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators uh, conference last year, November last year, uh, and the YMG, so the young members uh, division of that, ran a two-day training, which uh, many distinguished uh, persons spoke at, including Professor Onyema, who I think I can see uh, is amongst the attendees today as well, you know, and, and that, you know, that is an excellent way to, to start to learn from those who have practiced arbitration for a while and attempt to build one's real experience. Things like the Vismoot, uh, the Frankfurt Moot, the Jessup, that's always an excellent way, and opportunities perhaps to, even if not to sit as a tribunal secretary, to support a tribunal in one way or the other, our, our avenues in. But I think as well, you know, I think it's incumbent on international firms, and in fact all firms uh, of all sizes, to, to give a little back to the community, if I can put it that way, uh, in the sense of, you know, despite arbitration now being clearly an international practice, and clearly one that is growing in terms of the number of lawyers who, who, who play in the field, uh, there has always been, it seems to me, a very tight-knit community feel about it you know those who've been involved for a number of years all know each other we all see each other at the same events the same conferences we can almost predict each other's taglines to each other's jokes uh it's sort of that 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 close in a way uh, and so i think you know it, it, it's incumbent upon us to give back a little 
And so I would encourage young arbitrators to reach out to the more senior practitioners and just ask the question, what can they do to get involved? What experience can they have? Can they shadow for a week? Can they attend a hearing in the background? Whatever it happens to be. And you might well be surprised actually at how receptive uh, practitioners are to giving up their time or to assisting uh, and mentoring sort of the stars of the future because that is effectively what they are and will become. Thanks very much, Daniel. I, I, sus I suspect that, you know, sort of when we come to question time, we're, we're going to get a few um, comments or questions on this. But I, sure. I wanted to get back to the issue of dispute settlement arbitration mechanisms on the African continent. I mean, I think one of the concerns that many responsible officials have is that getting into international arbitration tends to be expensive. Expensive not only because of the lawyers who get hired, expensive because of travel, just, you know, sort of everybody going out to London or Paris or, or, or somewhere and, you know, sort of just it, it's it, it does uh, and it's a business which i mean it, for london 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 i think as an arbitration center it's been significant for the for the for its economy so i can well see why sort of african officials are interested in having um more arbitration conducted in Africa and apart from everything else just cultural context I mean you know sort of it's 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 it, it just makes more sense in terms of sensitivity to the local culture to have um, you know these uh, you know, sort of disputes resolved more and more here um, I, I I would like you to sort of just give us a preliminary reaction to what your sense is of the possibilities uh, there or in the hurdles, you know, sort of which which are faced, you know, in realizing that what is there that realistically can be done, and what is what is difficult, what is what may just be rhetorical. I mean, the, the, the issue of cost in arbitration is, is a problem that has been on the radar for very many years. One need only look at the various iterations of the Queen Mary's uh, survey that comes out every two or so years uh, to see that uh, sort of the, the, the negatives of arbitration, if I can put it that way, uh, to which uh, survey respondents point uh, you know, cost has been slowly coming up. The list of concerns are now, I, I may be wrong, but I seem to recollect that in the last edition, it was the number one concern that the survey respondents have. So clearly it is something that needs to be addressed. I think the old uh, tale that one of the benefits of arbitration over litigation is that it is cheaper, may no longer be true in the context of uh, very large international disputes when one compares that with, say, the English courts, for example. And I think it's also true that in every case, uh, the greatest portion of cost will almost certainly be lawyers' fees. Uh, so you and I, if we are equally guilty uh, of perpetuating the problem <laughs> whenever we act uh, as counsel. In terms of making it sort of uh, devising an arbitration solution that is more appropriate to uh, African business, African clientele, people wishing to resolve their disputes on the continent more generally. I think that's eminently feasible. Uh, simply the economics have to work. Uh, in an ad hoc arbitration scenario, one would have thought that the costs in terms of tribunal costs can be relatively managed. You effectively find a tribunal whose rates are within your expectations. And similarly, lawyers' fees can be managed too. But in the case of institutional arbitration, clearly it seems to me there is always going to be a question of how cheap can an institution uh, do the arbitration or, or you know, govern the arbitration. 
uh, and ultimately an institution needs to provide a level of service and so there needs to be a level of fee but i think harking back to my earlier comment you know it, it the, the biggest problem in a sense is lawyers fees uh, and i know there are initiatives now that have been kicked off as a consequence of the pandemic one that comes to mind is the kdri initiative which i think was launched perhaps a month or so ago which effectively is an initiative whereby arbitrators and counsel agree to cap their fees or agree to significantly discount their fees where disputes are connected with COVID-19 related uh, causative factors. So there are steps uh, that are there and which in principle could be, could be designed, but it's a difficult one. It is a difficult challenge. Yes, yes. I, I, I am hoping that we have Lawrence Ngugi, who is registrar of the Nairobi International Arbitration Center with us to just share some experiences of what it takes actually to run an arbitration center. I think uh, I see from uh, Emilia's work, Emilia Numa's work that the Nairobi International Arbitration Center is ranked among the first five or seven you know, sort of on the continent in terms of reputation and 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 what and who attractiveness to the respondents so you know i mean we all talk about this subject and i'm hoping that i'm sure that lawrence is going to sort of bring us down to to earth what what does it actually involve you know so lawrence please go Um, greetings all. Hi, Lawrence. Um, can you hear me? We can indeed. Go ahead. All right. Um, thank you. Greetings from Nairobi. It's a pleasure to join you. Uh, thank you um, to my good friend Sikata. Um, a pleasure meeting you, Daniel. Good. Um, where do I begin? What, are, what is the going down to uh, hitting the rubber hitting the road? Um, let me begin by saying one, it has been one of the most exciting experiences to have the privilege to um, run uh, literally from inception, um, see the uh, embryonic stage of the formation of a center, and then, as um, my good friend Fui has mentioned, to appear in a survey, an independent survey uh, of arbitration on the continent, um, evidencing the work that has gone into um, the Nairobi Center for International Arbitration. Now, the question, what does it take? What does it look like to run a center? Uh, let me begin by saying that there is nothing radically different in running an arbitral institution on the African continent um, as opposed to any other place on the globe. Um, uh, the rules, the mechanics, uh, the behind the scenes are in many ways basically the same. Um, however, uh, that said, um, if we were to have regard to this practice on the continent, there are possibly a couple of challenges which I have at least encountered in practice uh, which I may uh, share with you. I think the first one is um, the myth of track record. The myth of track record. Um, not to mean that track record is not important, uh, but there is a, a, an extent to which when you look at it from the perspective of where we sit, um, you could uh, define it as a myth, the myth of uh, track record. The first question that one um, must confront is, how many cases have you handled? Um, and so you give the answer, so many cases, or maybe no case. How many of those cases that you've handled are international in character? Well, you give a number. Uh, this number are international in character, and the statistics this year, that year, um, could build up to a particular number. Um, well, what about the value of those cases? So not only the, the international character of the cases, but also the value of those cases. Um, perhaps you have a number. Um, 
you have a value. Uh, so many USD, so many euros and the like. How many of those cases have no nexus to the continent? So the number of cases, the international character of the cases, and then the value of the cases. Uh, and if you have answers to all these, uh, then the question of do they have a nexus to the continent? Um, and, and, and the question here being, are they cases that are only based in Africa? Uh, so that even though they were international at the beginning, then there is the aspect of having an access to the continent. Now, obviously, if a center is 100 years old, um, that question might either be intimidating or inviting. Intimidating in this sense, if there is no statistics to show in the 100 years, then obviously it will be intimidating. On the other hand, if the, you have accumulated a wealth of cases uh, so that to the first question, uh, there is a clear track record of the number of cases you've handled over the years. Um, clearly, uh, most of them, a majority of them are international in character. The value of the cases obviously is high. Um, and, and of course, they are, they are of diverse uh, origin. They are not confined to one region. Then it's an inviting question. Now, for most of the centers on the continent, uh, with the exception perhaps of our brothers in Cairo who have been there longer, um, many of the responses to these questions uh, would almost be, um, as you would guess, um, not very inviting. Um, however, um, why I call it a myth is because when we think about the stage at which these centers are developing, uh, it is not surprising that um, centers of international arbitration have emerged on the continent at the same time when the continent has also gained prominence in terms of its participation in global economy. And so in time, will this be a mirage uh, so that the horizon looks bright uh, and perhaps this will no longer be a question to judge the performance on ability of a center? Uh, the jury is out there. Uh, to determine. The second challenge is one of the, the dilemma of the seat uh, and the location. Um, I think admittedly, again, we, we work in an environment where we have two dominant legal uh, systems. That's either the common law or the civil law um, uh, system. Everything else is in between there or not there. Um, you are either linked to these two or um, perhaps with the exception of the Islamic legal system, um, you're struggling to find your footing in either of them. So again, an arbitral institution is not only uh, to be gauged and judged on the yardstick of its own performance as an arbitral institution, but there's um, an element of connection to the legal system uh, where the center is located. And so the questions will arise, how friendly is your jurisdiction to uh, arbitration? How supportive is your jurisdiction uh, to um, uh, arbitration? Now again, um, you would expect of that question to the dominant legal systems and courts in those systems to be uh, quite inviting to answer. In our case, uh, some of these jurisdictions also have not really interacted much with cases that have um, an element of international arbitration. So if, if I would say the two main dominant challenges that we have have to do with the myth of track record and uh, the dilemma of the seat and location of the arbitral institution. Uh, perhaps with um, um, more time, I could uh, share uh, a little bit more on the challenges that we face. Thank you very much, Lawrence. Uh, Daniel, you know, we, you know, there are a couple of issues that we wanted to chat about, and I'm particularly interested in just talking about clients, you know, sort of different client profiles in international arbitration. I am conscious, however, of the fact that we promised our attendees that we would give them a lot of time to make interventions and um, you know, ask questions. 
So I would like to suggest that we pause at this moment, see what questions uh, attendees have or what contributions they have, and perhaps we can slip in, um, you know, sort of uh, a few words towards the end of, of the hour. Sure. I think, I think there are two questions that have been raised in the Q&A so far. If we... Ah, yes. I'm just... Uh, I'm just looking uh, at the, Julius has a question. Is Ju is uh, Rukia? Is is Julius? Shall I you know respond or shall I read it out? Maybe I'll read it out just to save us time. Uh, uh, and I think it's a it's a, a question to Daniel. Given what you have said regarding the increasing cost of arbitration, are we likely to see a big shift from arbitration to mediation in the light of the Singapore uh, agreement? And and then uh, and then um, th there's a second question, which which I, we might as well just uh, add on. How would you rate out of ten the participation of African lawyers in international arbitration? Uh, so perhaps you can you know sort of go ahead and and and, and talk about that. I, I'd like to sort of make some comments on the second, but 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 you can go ahead and and, and start with Julius. Yeah. I was going to say I, I would happily leave the rating of African lawyers and arbitration to you, Fui. Um, uh, so welcome your comments on that. On the first, uh, as always, a very insightful uh, comment from Julius. Um, and I, I should I should say that if ever there was a practitioner who is sensitive to costs in arbitration, Julius is one of them. So I'm not surprised that he has raised that question. Uh, I think it, it's. The, 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 the concept of mediation is an interesting one, actually, because there should be no particular feature of arbitration or litigation, in fact, that drives parties to mediation. What drives parties to mediation should be a desire to seek to avoid a dispute resolution mechanism altogether, no matter its nature, whether it's expert determination, litigation, arbitration or otherwise. Clearly, cost is one, is one evident factor in the decision-making that clients go through. And actually, I'm surprised more clients don't attempt to mediate when one considers that. Uh, and I think there are a number of reasons why, and we could spend all day, I'm sure, uh, talking about them. Uh, cultural uh, reasons clearly play a big part. I think you know, the, the arrival of the Singapore Agreement clearly is another string to mediation's bow. Uh, and so one would have thought that clients will consider mediation more carefully as a consequence. I think the current pandemic, and indeed take my jurisdiction, the UK government's effective notification to commercial parties that they should seek to avoid dispute resolution so as not to damage the economy any more than, has already, uh, any more than it has already faced are even bigger drivers to go to mediation. So I, I, I don't disagree with Julius's view. I think, you know, we may well see more mediation on the horizon, but I think why parties go to mediation is a very complicated, uh, is a very complicated question to answer, which, and, and cost is just one factor uh, that needs to be considered. If we, I'll hand over to you on rating uh, lawyers and international arbitration out of 10. I assume 10 is the best and zero is the worst. <laughs> yeah, well, let me answer the question, you know, sort of differently from numbers. I'm not, uh, I'm not great at numbers, so let me sort of just do impressions, you know. I mean, I've been involved in a few ma major cases in Ghana relating to international arbitration, international litigation. And I have participated in the decision making about identifying an arbitrator or an ad hoc judge to nominate. And, and I do not say this rhetorically at all. We've had no difficulty finding highly regarded, internationally regarded Africans to nominate of authority. You know, I mean, we've had absolutely no difficulty, you know. 
And, you know, the late Thomas Valde, I remember, said, made a joke to me uh, one day years ago that he thought that after gold and cocoa, lawyers must be Ghana's most prominent export. Now, that's just indicative of, you know, sort of in the world that he was operating on, in, he clearly had come across many lawyers of stature for whom he had regard. So I, I really don't think that it's an issue about finding uh, quality people. I do think there are some things that, you know, sort of we can all, all do, which is, you know, sort of maybe organizing in a more institutional way, lists of potential so that, we, you know, more gets to be known about them. It's more systematically done. I mean, law firms, particularly the big law firms, are often important in identifying and nominating arbitrators for their clients. So getting them to recognize their obligation to give access and take the thing beyond a small club, you know, and getting particularly Afghan governments who are involved in the big cases to pay attention to the potential of African arbitrators, it would seem to me, are the, 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 the challenges that we ought to uh, uh, sort of, uh, you know, sort of face, I, 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 uh, I would say. I don't know whether there's, in, those are the, the, the I, 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 I don't know, da, Daniel, have you seen any other question? I think those are the two questions that we have. Have I, you seen any other? Well, I think, I think Ben Sanderson has just very kindly, almost perfectly timed, uh, submitted another question. But whilst you consider that one, Fui, I might add my own observations on, on the point you, you've just made. Uh, which is, uh, I completely agree. I don't think there is a quality problem per se. I think the problem is access. I think uh, there is much that needs to be done in the way that you suggested to provide, for example, council looking to appoint uh, arbitrators from the continent with, with uh, a database or access to, to where those persons lie. I mean, I, th I think it's it, one, it's very difficult to talk about Africa generally in this regard, because of course, you know, it's a continent of 54, depending on who you speak to, 55 uh, countries, you know, all with clearly different levels of expertise amongst the legal bars in arbitration. But, but it's certainly in my experience on my travels around the continent, I've always been very impressed at the level of understanding of arbitration. And then I do think, you know, I, I do think there is a very real difference between arbitration and litigation in, in the philosophy of it and the way one has to think about it. And so you know, I would encourage the arbitration practitioners on the continent to identify themselves, to distinguish themselves, I think it is notable that in many law firms, many of the largest firms on the continent, you don't see a dedicated arbitration practice, which is understandable. It has its origins in, in this sort of the historical breakdown of, of dispute resolution. But I think taking those steps to identify yourselves will assist and can only help to, to, uh, to, to the further the success of arbitration on the continent and to dispel the myth, because I think it is a myth, uh, that the level of experience and expertise of arbitration on the continent is lacking because I, I am proven wrong time and time again on that front. Everyone I meet is always exceptionally impressive. Um, I am in danger of being accused of nepotism. <laughs> I can see that the two questions on the, sh on the Chachu are from my friend Ben Sanderson and my brother Chachu. Um, so I, I, I mean, I don't know whether the, the Chachu's question is actually directed explicitly to Leu, but I suspect that Leu is off. I think we've also had another question from uh, Emilia. Emilia. So that might give you a third option for you. So you have to decide. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> well, actually, it seems to me as though if I if reading uh, Emilia's uh, sort of question, it, it seems to me to be related to Ben's. I mean, in other words, in order to get coherence on the African continent about uh, investment treaty protection, shouldn't we have uh, some institution collectively um, formulating or representing the continent in formulating the requisite treaty protect, uh, protections? I suppose this, this would relate both to uh, you know, sort of protections with countries outside the continent or regional blocks outside the continent, as well as within the continent. That, you know, sort of, I mean, I, that's what I, I see to be the um, question. Now, I'm no expert in this area, but it just, it seems to me that at least in theory, that would make sense. I wonder whether the Secretariat of the Continental Free Trade uh, Agreement, you know, could possibly, I mean, not, not take it on themselves, but whether this is something which can be done under the auspices of, of, of that. But I, I rather suspect that this is an issue that we need to be spending some time thinking about. And perhaps the African Arbitration Association, you know, we could make this part of a conversation and see what proposals we can, uh, uh, we, we, we can come up with. I, I would have two observations on that, Free, and I think the questions of Emilia and Ben are, are great questions. It seems to me that, that, that in, what you are describing is in part what the African Union is there to do and is seeking to achieve. And if one looks at the, I believe it's the 2063 objectives, uh, you know, the, the Continental Free Trade Agreement is one of those objectives. Uh, and, you know, the sort of the harmonization of political, legal, trade principles uh, you know, appears very much at the forefront of what the union is doing. So I suspect there is a conversation underway, or at least there ought to be within that forum. I certainly sympathize with Amelia's comment that there are plenty of regional model investment codes, such as ICOWAS, already uh, in place. Uh, the comment I would have on that is, if ever one wants to uh, enjoy a very colorful diagram, uh, I would encourage you to attempt to draw all of the regional codes and trade blocks that Africa currently has uh, into a Venn diagram by reference to each of the countries to which they are a party. Uh, and very quickly, you will see that you have, you've run out of colors and you run out of shapes and space on your page because there are so many regional blocks that overlap in so many ways. And so clearly an element of rationalization is probably merited. Uh, and again, the African Union has a role I suspect to play there. That all said, I do think there is a potential danger in treating all African states as one in terms of the harmonization of economic principles. And the one story that comes to mind was a debate I had in Lagos last year with a number of people as to whether Ghana, Nigeria or Senegal produced the best jollof. And that was a debate that was never settled and got very quickly rather heated and perhaps even more heated than the pepper soup I was being served at the time. Uh, and so I think, you know, that is, it, it's, a, it's a silly example, but it's an example of perhaps sometimes uh, it is difficult to reach economic harmony uh, across uh, a continent. And so one has to strike the right balance uh, on that. Daniel, I fear we've run out of time. This has, I, this has definitely been, I have enjoyed the conversation and I'm sure others have. There, are, I, I see that there is at least one more question. Up. Unfortunately, we, we don't have the time for it. I, I think perhaps what we can do is that, of course, the African Arbitration Association has a website and I would encourage, you know, sort of everybody to sort of go to that uh, uh, w w website. Uh, the president of, of the African Arbitration Association, Chief Bayo Ojo, has responded to the, uh, the latest uh, question from Senanu Ashiabo. So uh, Senanu, I hope you've seen 
chief bios res response it's open so i'm sure that other people have seen it but we we definitely we have run out of, of time on, on, unfortunately um i mean i think this we don't it goes without saying that arbitration is whether we like it or not you know sort of here very much to stay there are different possibilities with it uh, and you know it provides different opportunities so and we you know so there will be many more conversations like this we we were planning our annual uh, meeting was supposed to have been in ghana uh, sort of in june but that got postponed to next year because of uh, covid uh, so please check our website the african arbitration website for the you know sort of rescheduled date and the the program when we come so i'd like to thank everybody for for uh, attending this conversation um the next uh, event is going to be on the on the 10th of september at uh, 2 p.m gmt plus one in other words uh, uk time west africa time uh, three o'clock um it's this is on 10th september and it's going to involve you know sort of one of our board members mrs are doing rose vivo she's going to be interviewed by uh, uh niat ahuja so please go again if you can go to the website of the african arbitration association and look out for the announcement of the exact topic thank you all very much and i a special thanks to rukia who has avoided being seen and yes who has effectively organized this putting these uh, seminars these invitation co conversations was rukia's idea and she's been in the background effectively handling things organizing quietly sending us messages and making sure that things run smoothly so thank you to rukia thanks everybody thanks daniel and good goodbye thank you everyone have a good uh, rest of your day and a good weekend when it starts <laughs>